to part three of our interview with Glenn Sheehelm. Uh, Glenn, we had gotten you in your story from late 1966. You had made it as far as Vietnam. You were assigned to the 1st Cavalry Division at An You had already gone up, I guess, as a courier, fly up to Play Coup, uh, and now... That was actually across the Play Coup. They'd be west on Highway 19, yeah. And uh, it wasn't really much north. It was mostly west. Yeah. And... Uh, which was where the, you know, they staged out of for the uh, whole hydrain campaign and so forth. Um, okay, and uh, on the way back from Blake, we had a little bit of excitement, but it wasn't any major thing. And uh, I got back and they said, you haven't been to the welcome camp yet. And I said, welcome camp? And they said, yeah, it's first camp's training school or training academy or something like that. And uh, they said, uh, um, they'll pick you up tomorrow with the, with the new staff. I said, well, what do I have to take? I said, well, uh, due to the fact that part of this is to uh, get uh, get an infantry when acclimated, but also to get anybody that was working closely with the in infantry acclimated to life of infantry men so he could understand it. So they said, um, you'll be gone five days. You just take your normal field gear and your M16. And I said, well, I haven't shot the M16 yet. And they said, um, yeah, no problem. You'll go ahead and zero it and get a chance to shoot it at this welcome camp. So uh, I jumped onto the deuce and a half, and we got to uh, where, the, where the welcome camp was. And uh, they had some classrooms there that uh, were kind of sandbagged outlines. And they had uh, uh, general purpose tents over the top. Uh, they had uh, generators outside, some of them that kind of clattered away, and they had a piece of uh, fairly new equipment at that time, which was an overhead projector. Now, any, uh, any teacher in the 60s, 70s, and 80s wouldn't have been able to survive, I don't think, without an overhead projector. But they had those there, and they had uh, oversized slides. and. Uh, as we got started in the camp, I noticed that uh, there were a couple names that popped up, one being familiar, one of them being Captain Ted Danielson, who was the guy I had seen in this television program uh, prior to going there. And the other one was a guy by the name of Roy Martin, and it, it says both of them were infantry captains. And I thought, hey, that's kind of cool. You know, I thought Danielson's company was real well, real well done, and he's and he and Roy Martin have apparently had uh, some input in putting this whole welcome camp program together. And they'd been infantry officers and they'd served combat time. So uh, anyway, I was pretty receptive to that. And uh, one of the things they had was um, uh, one of the instructors came in and proceeded to give us uh, uh, a very gruesome lecture about all the various types of venereal diseases that were around Vietnam. And I think uh, probably everybody in Vietnam at every welcome camp probably got those. Uh, and they also happened to mention that if you signed out, you know, at base camp, there were boxes of condoms there. You know, were supposed to take a couple with you when you signed out that you were going off post anywhere. So uh, that was, that was part of the classroom education. They also showed us uh, pictures of various types of booby traps and the wounds from various types of booby traps. Um, we got uh, some more introduction to first aid dealing with gunshot wounds. Uh, we practiced bandaging each other up, throwing different types of splints on, and uh, it was uh, probably uh, about the uh, third day, they took us out to the range with our M16s and any other weapons we were assigned. Well, uh, I, at the time, I was just assigned the M16 and, of course, 45 that I would just carry when I was a courier. And uh, um, I shot the 45 and didn't do very well. I never mastered the 45 during the time I was in the service. Um, the M16 was a little different. Uh, they had some um, uh, wooden or uh, dark black squares, about uh, like that, that had a notch out of the bottom, 
and those were set out at uh, 25 yards, which they called their thousand inch range. And uh, we were supposed to go ahead and line up our front sights, so it came right up to the bottom of that little cutout white square, and go ahead and, and fire three shots and, and see where they went. We'd make the sight adjustment until we had uh, three hits in this area the size of a quarter that had a circle around it was right below. Well, uh, I did that and I was kind of enjoying shooting the M16. Didn't kick bad, seemed to be pretty accurate, and I heard some strange stories about it that, uh, yeah, it was so deadly because the bullets came out of the barrel flipping end over end, which uh, I immediately knew was just a jungle story. It had absolutely nothing to do with reality because I knew firearms pretty well prior to going over there. And no, that would not work if it actually flipped the bullet end over end. It would be terribly inaccurate. And I noticed that all of them made nice clean bullet holes, not only in my target, but every other one that I looked at up and down the line. Well, um, I kept shooting two that I knew were going to be in, and I'd shoot one a little bit off to the side. And there was a sergeant there by the name of Parlo, and he says, um, okay, uh, you go ahead and get off the range. They're not all three in, but he says, you've done this five times in a row now where you've managed to put one off. You just want to burn ammo. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, okay. And he said, uh, and then I you know, heard his name was Parlo, and I said, uh, you have a brother that served in Germany? And he said, uh, uh, yes. And uh, I said, uh, did he get some burns while he was in Germany? Uh, yeah. Well, this was the same guy that dumped the, the aviation gas. You know, it was his brother that dumped the aviation gas in Germany and uh, caused the fire in our tent there. And he was, uh, you know, glad I knew his brother, but not real pleased that I knew the situation <laughs> about it. And uh, anyway, we finished uh, sighting in the, the uh, rifles and uh, he didn't let me play around a whole lot more that afternoon with the AR-15 or M16. He decided that I had it pretty well zero. Now the M16 um, was uh, the first cab was the first unit to actually go to Vietnam and have that as the issue weapon. You know there were some special forces troops that had them earlier, but a regular army unit, the first cab, was the first one that went over with it. And it was kind of nice because it only weighed about seven pounds. I was two and a half pounds lighter than the M14, and the ammunition was only a little over half the weight of what the M14 ammo, which uh, fired a 762 round, which is also known as the 308 Winchester in uh, American uh, terms. But uh, it uh, had a plastic stock on it. Uh, it had a plastic hand guard, it had a gas tube that came up underneath the front sight and went underneath that stock and then went into a gas impingement system that went down to uh, three little um, uh, uh, like gas cylinder rings that sealed it and then uh, the thing, thing worked. Now, um, it sounded kind of strange because when it fired both the bolt and bolt carrier came back as one piece and went whipping by your ear where there's a uh, spring inside of the stock. So every time you fired it, uh, if there weren't a lot of other people firing where you had you know, disturbances from noise, it sounded like a kid just jumped by your ear on a pogo stick. So you know, you'd know you hear that spring go back and forth. And um, So it was a, a different type of rifle. I liked it. Um, we had... Uh, at that time, we were only getting the ammo that was uh, made by Remington Arms, and it used the original powder that that gun was tested with. Mm -hmm. uh, so we didn't, you know, first cab didn't have a real problem with those to begin with. Um, now later on, they had a different powder thing that uh, caused some calcite buildup, and uh, they got a little bit less reliable and you had to clean them pretty carefully because around helicopters there's all kinds of dust and crap that was getting blown into them. 
Well, after the after the rifle range. Well, before and, we go on with that, just yeah. uh, with the M16, the wrap on the M16, or the main one that I've run across, and people told me about, was that uh, they tended to jam a lot, and particularly if you had a full magazine of all 20 rounds in it. Uh, and then the standard thing that a lot of them were doing, say by 1969, was put 18 rounds in it. And um, you know, with uh, some of the magazines, that seemed to be true. We had Colt magazines. They had some made by companies that made metal toys and, you know, other things like uh, there was even the, the joke that the M16 was made by Mattel. I saw M16s made by Hydromatic Division of General Motors, but I never saw anything made by Mattel in spite of all the jokes. And uh, again, most of them were made by Colt. And, um, Anyway, uh, after uh, getting familiar with the M16, uh, they went ahead and uh, took us out to uh, an area where they had a training center that had a tower in it. And at this tower, there were helicopter skids attached probably 40 feet off the ground. And we would climb up a ladder, get on the top of this tower, and they would show us how to hook onto the rope with a thing called a carabiner. Uh, now, you just didn't hold on to the rope, you put on what they called a Swiss seat, which was made of larger diameter but a little bit softer rope. And they issued us one of those and that was something that most of us carried through Vietnam would have it hooked onto our web gear. And uh, now this Swiss seat, it'd start with a loop around your waist and it would cross in the center and then it would drop between your legs, come up over around your buttocks, uh, loop over the rope again, and then go around and tie off. Uh, it also got the nickname the Nutcracker. Uh, but, you know, the real thing was the Swiss seat, and you'd tie that on while you were squatting down so there wasn't any slack, because if you didn't have slack in there, there was less chance of the sudden jolt and sudden discomfort <laughs> of this... Uh, Swiss seats. So anyway, they taught us how to get into the, you know, get those on and uh, uh, we'd stand on the top of the tower, hook our carabiner to that where it had a loop over the top, and then we'd uh, step onto the skid. Now, when you stepped onto the skid, they would have you lean back and tell you that when you first jumped, to go ahead and let out six feet of rope. Now, there was a reason why you didn't let out two or three feet of rope, because if you let out two or three feet of rope, you were going to come right back into the skid with your forehead just about at the base of your helmet. So you wanted to make sure that you let out enough rope so you'd actually swing underneath this platform a little bit. And when we actually did it out of the helicopters, we would actually swing underneath the helicopter for the first swing, then let go, you know, four or five times and we'd be down to the ground. Um, now there was uh, one video of the first cab where it shows uh, the helicopter having a problem and coming down very quickly right after the guy hit the ground with his, with his uh, seat. And you can see this soldier looking very disgustedly at the helicopter in that you know, military video. Uh, but uh, anyway, we did that several times. Uh, just with our web gear on first and then with our packs on because your balance was a little different and you had to hold the rope mm -hmm. on the front a little bit different so you didn't tip over. Now the first two times they had a safety guy down at the bottom. So if you panicked and let go of the rope, he was, you know, there were uh, actually two ropes going through it. He was going to pull one, the thing would jam up on his carabiner. You may be hanging upside down but you were not coming all the way to the ground until he released pressure on that rope so that he would slide down. So they had some safety procedures involved in the training with this. Uh, the other thing that we did was learn how to survive around helicopters, you know, watching tail rotor blades approaching from the side, not the front where the pilot or co-pilot could see you all the time, and, you know, not all of a sudden pull pitch and lean forward and take your head off or uh, do a pedal turn where you were back there by the tail rotor someplace 
and all of a sudden you're going to walk into this big fan, which did occasionally happen in the first calf. You know, you, I think uh, incidents like that generally happen in the Army because, you know, you get a bunch of 19-year-old kids doing things they've never done before, and you've got all these dangerous machines around. Uh, there was a good friend of mine that never made it to Vietnam because he was moving on to a um, train car and uh, a bulldozer uh, kind of goofed and he caught a bulldozer blade at the knee. And, uh, you know, okay, uh, medical discharge and he's out. And uh, so those types of things happen. There were guys that got hands caught in breach blocks in Germany, guys that ran over, you know, got their feet run over by a tank or, uh, you know, things like that happen around when you're around that much equipment. Okay. Now uh, you're talking about going out off of this platform. Uh, a lot of people talk about training, they talk about repelling and looking Yeah, and that's what we did, we okay. repelled down. But, but then they say that they never actually did that in the field. Uh, Did you actually use? Uh, we I actually repelled in twice during my time mm -hmm. that I was there. It wasn't something that we did all the time. Uh, but another thing that we trained for was how to get into a CH-47. It's the big twin loader helicopter if they couldn't land. Now, uh, there they did have a hoist on them where they could bring you up by hoist into a CH-47. But you didn't want to do that because if that happened, you were probably going up because you were wounded. <laughs> and, you know, where they would hoist you up on a Stokes letter. Um, but the normal way of getting up into those was to uh, climb a ladder, similar to what the Navy used to use, getting troops off ships and stuff. Well, with a ship, you've got something that ladder hangs up against. Uh, climbing up into a Chinook, on a ladder that is swinging like this, especially if you were the last person on the ladder, because there was nobody hanging on, helping to hold that thing still. And, you know, you're, you're kind of fumbling, trying to grab rungs of the ladder and trying to get your feet on the, on the rungs of the ladder, which is constantly moving. That, that scared me a whole lot worse than repelling out of helicopters, you know. It was just one super frightening experience for me. And I hoped I was never going to have to do one of those in combat. And fortunately, I did not. Um, now, they had another thing where they showed us uh, how we might possibly get picked up. And it was called a McGuire rig. Now, that was one that not only had the seat down here, but it had a shoulder harness attached to it. Uh, they were used primarily to get uh, recon teams out. And... Uh, you know, he had carabiners on both sides and this McGuire rig actually hooked onto the carabiners and it would fly you out hanging underneath this helicopter, bouncing through branches until they got to a safe area where they could land on and you, and you climbed on it normally. Now, uh, this is basically being swung around like a sinker on the end of a fish line. <laughs> Uh, not, not really a, a, a fun situation, but it didn't scare me near as much as uh, climbing up the ladder. Now, I didn't have to use McGuire rig uh, other than one time in Vietnam, um, but uh, anyway, that, that McGuire rig was there and I thought it was in a way kind of cool. Uh, it also gave me a sense of understanding special forces and recon teams. And, what they needed and you know so forth. Uh, then they took us out um, on a couple patrols where we actually uh, first time went through a village that was all in our safe area but it had dummy booby traps in it so we could see what it was actually like going through that type of uh, situation and then we went out and actually did it for real. We went probably a mile and a half outside of the perimeter and did a patrol out there, pretty much like uh, they normally did around base camp. You know, infantry platoons would be sent out. They were primarily counter-mortar ambushes. You know, the idea was to catch the bad guys setting up a mortar out there to fire mortar rounds into base camp and on K. Uh, the targets were that they took were occasionally troop areas, and more frequently 
it was a big area which they called the golf course. Um, and it wasn't really a golf course, but uh, Harry W. O. Kennard says, you know, that area is where the helicopters are going to come in. We're not going to chew it up with bulldozers. You're going to go out there with shovels and machetes. And he said, when you get done, it's going to look like a golf course because we don't want all kinds of debris messing up our helicopters. Now, the heli uh, for, like I said, the 1st Cavalry Division had more helicopters than anybody else in Vietnam and more than the whole Marine Corps did. So uh, helicopters were going to be an important part of our life. Well, I got through this, uh, this training thing and uh, got back to the uh, battery area and there was a guy by the name of Henry Stiller uh, who um, definitely talked like he was from Tennessee, but he may not have been, you know, he might have been from the Carolinas, but uh, anyway, he said, well, uh, you know, you got your clothes all dirty because during that five-day thing, they didn't let us take a shower, they didn't let us change clothes. It's, okay, we want you to understand these infantrymen that you're going to be supporting. You know, it's, uh, uh, the only advantage was the first three days we got to sleep on cots in a tent, but the last two days we slept on the ground, uh, you know, like, infantrymen would and one the one night we did night, uh, night ambush practice we actually dug in uh, so uh, you know we said well uh, we'll go to the go to the laundry in in Anke where you know the women would wash them in a stream and stuff and uh, anyway um, Stoller decided he wanted to enjoy the uh, the features of a young lady that lived in this laundromat area and he said well just kind of watch the jeep so i'm sitting there out in the jeep with my m16 wondering where the first grenade is coming from i'm kind of new to the country and a little bit jumpy at this time so i mean my head's on a swivel continuously this whole time now the jeep actually was not a problem as far as some kid dropping a grenade down the gas spout because number one it was too narrow and then it had the bend in it where it was going to hang up before it went down in there. But the story was with the uh, deuce and a half trucks uh, that somebody would take a grenade with a rubber band wrapped around it after the pin had been pulled, and drop it in there, and as the grenade jostled around and the rubber band got weaker because of the attack of the, the fuels on it, uh, the grenade would go off and, you know, this truck would go up in a ball of flame. Uh, I don't know how often that happened, but, you know, I'd always heard the stories about it, and I had uh, some concerns about that type of thing. Well, uh, I also had uh, um, my first cab patches with me, and they sewed those on at this laundry thing because it was a seamstress right there. So, you know, I had my, my patches, and all of a sudden I looked not like the new guy, but I looked like somebody that actually belonged to the first cab after that. And uh, Henry told me, you know, uh, you got to get a floppy hat too. And I said, but we're not allowed to wear floppy hats. And he said, well, when you get out in the field, you'll be able to get away with them sometimes. And I thought, okay. So I went ahead and got one of the one of the floppy hats in town at one of the stores that, uh, that sold them. And we referred to them as go to hell hats because when the majors and generals put their helicopters to bed for the night, that was, you know, sort of a comment about generals and, and spit and polish officers that might be around, you know, that uh, the guys would wear them some at night. And we wore those on color teams later on when I got out uh, with four observer team, but uh, uh, didn't wear that much you know, when I was with uh, 2nd and 19th, but I did have it. Um, well, I, uh, we got back in, and about two days after that, we got a uh, warning order that we were going to uh, be uh, moved on Highway 19 across the uh, Anke Pass. That's the one between Anke and the coastal town of Pleiku. And, or the coastal town of Quinyan, mm -hmm. which was on the, on the South China Sea. And then there would be helicopters to pick us up. Well, um, I got in the back of this deuce and a half truck and 
Um, there was a guy by the name of Rufus Benford. He was from the Detroit area. And uh, uh, he had a hatchet with him, which he set on the top of this stuff we had covered with tarp in the back of the truck. And I made a comment to one of the other guys about the hatchet. And I said, is that to help clear underbrush when we get down? And he says, no, uh, uh, not last time we were out, but two times ago, there was a Viet Cong that came up the side of the truck and was going to throw a satchel charge into the truck. And he says, Rufus took him down with a hatchet. I'm thinking, oh, okay, this uh, supposedly, you know, semi-rear area job uh, working with artillery FDC may not be as quiet as I thought it was going to be. And uh, so anyway, I kind of thought, well, I'll keep that in mind about Rufus Binford being pretty good with hatchet and, uh, you know, being kind of an aggressive guy in the field, should I ever want to know who, who to kind of follow along behind. So uh, anyway, they took us to this uh, uh, area over the man, over the uh, Anke Pass. Now, the Anke Pass by this time had a fuel line that went up alongside the road. And every once in a while they didn't have guard posts there that had, you know, like big things where they'd turn the, turn the fuel off because the Viet Cong would occasionally find one of these places that they didn't think was guarded adequately, uh, put some explosives on it and blow a hole in the fuel line. Now that brought uh, helicopter fuel from Quinh Yan where the big Big boats came in, tankers, they had you know, tank farms and everything there, uh, up to On K. Now, at On K, we had the fuel not in big uh, tanks, but in things called blivets. They were big rubber things. Well, kind of the balloons. Fuel, the fuel ones were uh, actually a little bit larger than this room. And they had those, you know, various places. They'd be filled with helicopter fuel. and. They had low gasoline pumps that would move them from there to the to the helicopters when they came in to land. So, um, you know, uh, a good way to stop the 1st Cavalry Division would be to stop the fuel supply. And the Viet Cong knew that, so there were these checkpoints where they'd close it off and, uh, you know, immediately there would be somebody that would be sent out the engineering thing and, and get a, you know, pull a bulldozer down because they usually had bulldozers parked at most of these checkpoints so they could get a bulldozer and some engineers. The engineers wouldn't necessarily stay at the checkpoint, but there would be one flown out by helicopter that could drive this bulldozer and, you know, cover up the dirt holes and craters and, and so forth. And they'd go ahead and fix this pipeline and first cab would continue getting fuel. Uh, well, we'd seen those along the uh, on K Pass, and then we got to this area that looked like a sort of a truck pullover stop thing, and we pulled in there, and there were CH-47 helicopters that landed. Uh, now, this was my first time going into you know what I figured could be a combat situation. I thought, well, I'm apparently not going on the first lift because I'm climbing onto a Chinook helicopter. First lift would be. Huey helicopters. And uh, so anyway, I climbed in there and they drove a Jeep with a commo trailer behind it. And uh, they flew us to a place called Landing Zone Pony. Now Landing Zone Pony from the town of Bong Song is southwest of there, not too far from a place called Elsie Bird, which, you know, is going to be of significance a little bit later on. But uh, anyway, they dropped us off at LZ Pony with these uh, helicopters, and there was barely enough room to run things like the combo jeeps around, you know. But uh, uh, we started hacking away at the underbrush, and we dug holes. And, um, from the hole that I slept in to the jungle was about the distance you and I are apart, you know. The, those first couple of weeks, so we were, you know, pretty close to things right there. And we also set up our fire direction center. Now the fire direction center was a matter of filling a whole bunch of sandbags and then a, you know, GP medium tent over the top. And uh, 
um, you know, the plotting boards in there, the, the radios in there, and we had two generators because when you're at a battalion fire direction center for an artillery unit like 2nd and 19th was, you know, artillery is supposed to uh, move, shoot, communicate. And communicate was a big thing because um, uh, artillery landing zones were kind of like forts in the far west, you know, where you had a, a fort with the cavalrymen at it and you had this big open area of nothing around it. Eventually you'd come to another fort. Well, the idea was to try building these fire bases to where one fire base could fire artillery to help support another one. And we could support LZ Bird. Uh, they could support both Bird and Pony from LZ Hammond with the uh, 175 millimeter guns, but we were out of range of the eight inches from there. Now the eight inches and 155s could both um, support us from uh, a little bit farther up towards um, Bong song. But, uh, and of course, Bird and Pony could each support each other. So, um, anyway, uh, we proceeded to go ahead and hack away at stuff with machetes and shovels. And uh, after about a week, they brought in um, a bulldozer in pieces. And uh, the thing was assembled. And then that started plowing the whole top of this, this little hill up that we were on. And uh, which was cool until monsoon season came a little bit later in December because it turned it into a total sea of mud. I mean, this is boot top deep mud because when you're dry, well, at that time they also, uh, uh, during the monsoon season, they brought in a third of the 18th artillery. Now they had second and 17th artillery, which was an old fashioned 105 unit. Uh, but 3rd of the 18th had 8-inch uh, and 175 self-propelled guns. To even get those in there across the mucky ice, rice paddies, uh, we had to go out with debt cord and wrap it around palm trees and blow them in half and lay down a corduroy road to even get these artillery pieces up to LZ Pony because they had to come across this muddy Race paddy. You know, were your own guns there at this point? Uh, well, 2nd and the 19th at that time did not have any artillery pieces on Pony. We did on LZ Bird, we did on a couple of the other nearby LZs, like B Battery 2nd and 19th was on LZ Bird. We had 2nd uh, and the 17th, which had the old fashioned 105s right. on Pony. Sure. And these big uh, 8 inches and 175s came in. And also, at the end of 1966, First Brigade, First Cav went off airborne status. Uh, they wanted to have a last hurrah. So they uh, laid on this big mission with C-130s flying over and big pallets of 8-inch 175 ammo dropped by parachutes. And they said uh, they wanted us to all make sure we were in our tents or our sleeping quarters in case one of the parachutes failed. And I'm thinking, okay, this canvas tent is going to be a whole lot of protection from this thing that weighs about as much as a car that's coming down under this this parachute. You know, if it doesn't land out there in the rice paddy and it lands on the LZ right where we are. Uh, well, they dropped the stuff down um, and we went out and picked it up by helicopter. Now, remember this is rainy season, so uh, the rotor blades on the Hueys get a lot of static buildup in the rain and, you know, the very dense atmosphere. Uh, we quick like learned that uh, when you unhooked one of these parachutes and rolled it up and got ready to hook it onto a helicopter, that the helicopter would come down, you know, you'd be looking at the hook probably about that much over your head and you'd have this, this bunch of straps that went to this Thing that you know was kind of an eye hook with a bolt through it, a big bolt through it, and you'd go up like this and sort of throw it onto that hook because if you were still hanging on to that metal thing at the uh, you know as it hit the uh, helicopter, you were going to get a jolt that was going to throw you right off that pallet of ammunition back into the rice paddy 
with a, a very noticeable, hey, stupid, you know. <laughs> uh, but uh, so anyway, we hooked up the stuff and had it flown back into the third of the 18th, which was on LC Pony. And uh, some of the times the Viet Cong uh, got a little bit bored and we'd get some sniper fire while we were out there. But generally, you know, there was no real heavy fire that we had during that time period. So if your guns aren't there, why are you on LZ Pony? Uh, because at headquarters second and the 19th, we controlled where every gun in first brigade was going to shoot. Uh, so in other words, we controlled what were second and nineteenth shot, were second and seventeenth shot, were um, uh, third of the eighteenth shot, uh, were sixth and sixteenth, which is one five five unit shot, and of course any batteries attached to us or any of those other units. So there were a whole bunch of people that. Uh, where an artillery fire mission would call in to us by radio and give the location, grid location, nature of target, and where the nearest friendlies were, and we would go ahead and look at our chart, figure out which battery could most safely fire this particular mission, uh, pick the pick the unit and say uh, uh, diesel speech uh, uh, three three. This is uh, Tiger. Uh, Tiger 2 India, you know, which is a call sign I used uh, working intelligence and operations. This is Tiger 2 India, your grid is clear. Uh, go to Fox 13, which was code for radio channel. It would flip to, and then they'd talk to 1st the 30th. And we would also put a, put a radio on 1st the 30th uh, fire control frequency because we would check their original data. In other words, they would uh, uh, figure out where, you know, from where they were and where the target was, and give the distance, the number of meters, the elevation that they had to have on the guns, and we would check that with our slide rule and our plotting board in headquarters second and nineteenth. And then we'd say the grid is clear, the grid is safe, you know, and and. Uh, First and thirtieth, they had the mission and fire it. All right. So you're doing fire direction control. Yeah. But you had not trained. Uh, that yeah, that that was an on-the-job training thing, uh, where they taught me how to use the the plotting board and how to use the slide rule. Um, I've got a one five five slide rule still sitting in my attic at home, uh, but uh, you know it's uh, and and it's one of those well. Later on, um, there was a, a girl here in Muskegon, she was a third grader at uh, Marquette School, and she was going to do a um, project on how artillery uses mathematics. Uh, her teacher was uh, Carol Vanis over at Marquette School, and Carol knew that I'd been in artillery in Vietnam. so. She had this girl come over to Steel School and talk to me about whether I'd be willing to help her do her project. Well, she really got into this. I mean, really, really got into this learning fire direction control. And uh, uh, we went ahead and actually made a plotting board. Uh, we made a deflection fan out of wood, not a nice, you know, super cut one with aluminum and stuff. but. We made the thing out so that she could go in and figure uh, distance, direction, and look on a map. And we had uh, Steel School and Marquette School, you know, with the difference in elevation and the whole thing plotted out on this map. And uh, she wanted to learn how to use the slide rule, so I taught her how to use the artillery slide rule. And she said, can we go shoot artillery? And I said, Hey, excuse me, but these bullets were real big, and we went down to a place called Foxhole down in Holland. It was run by a World War II vet. And I showed her what artillery rounds looked like, and she said, you can't shoot those at your rifle range? And I said, no. Uh, and they said, and she said, well, you know, they're, they're reserve units, National Guard units, where do they shoot? I said, up at Camp Grayling. 
can we go to Camp Grayling? No, we're not going to Camp Grayling. Uh, and I finally worked out a deal where we could go over near Lansing. They had a small field training area where they didn't actually shoot, but where they went through the motions. And um, there was a chief firing battery there that was an older guy. And he thought it was the neatest thing he'd ever done in his life was teach this little girl who's standing on top of a couple of ammo boxes how to run the aiming circle and, and lay the battery. I mean, you know, here's this, this little girl, you know, that's uh, standing up there on these ammo boxes and uh, calling commands to the, the guns on to make sure they're all pointed the same way. Now, they didn't actually load any rounds and, and tear up anybody's farm outside of Lansing, but, uh, you know, they went through, went through the motions. And this girl really, really loved that experience and uh, uh, I know the Chief of Smoke did too. He thought that was the coolest thing in the world. So anyway, back to uh, fire direction control and you know kind of learned this is on the job training and uh, um, Captain, uh, Captain Weber uh, decided that you know I seem to be pretty comfortable out in the woods. I'd hunted and stuff and he said uh, uh, you know, here's some stuff to, to make some maps. He said, uh, we want information on where there are any foxholes and spider holes outside of uh, LZ Pony. And uh, he said, go ahead and uh, get three guys to go with you and, and go ahead and start running, you know, putting together maps on what the terrain outside of LZ Pony looks like. Well, one of the guys I picked was Rufus Benford. And uh, one of the times when we were out doing that, uh, we came across this skull. Uh, Rufus decided he wanted the skull. Well, I did some checking, made sure it wasn't booby trapped. And we picked it up and carried it to the rest of our patrol. And we got to going back in the perimeter. And Rufus Spinford has got his elbow crook like that. He's got the skull underneath his elbow. He's petting the top of the skull like he would a, a little dog or kitty cat or something like that. And of course the guys on the perimeter, they see him coming in like that and they're just, oh, gross, you know? And uh, uh, we got it back in and I said, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, he said, well, um, here's the skull. And I said, Rufus, I don't want the skull. And he said, well, you could put it on top of your radio on the talk. And I said, no, I get along pretty well with some of the officers right now. I am not going to put that skull on top of my radio in the Tactical Operations Center, which is this tent surrounded by sandbags. And he said, well, nobody sees it real well by where I am. And he says, we ought to show it off. And he says, you're, by the way, that most of the guys... Uh, walk along the edge of that side of the perimeter and go to the mess tent. I said, yeah. He said, how about if we put it on the sandbags by your tent? And I said, well, yeah. Oh, well, okay. So I've got to put there. About two days later, there's a guy that walks by and he sees the skull there. And uh, when he caught me at the tent, he said, uh, could I by any chance have that skull? And I said, what in the world would you want that skull for? And he sat down in the sandbags with me and pulls out this Dear John letter that he had received. And it's getting, you know, we're, we're starting into December. And he says, uh, I want to send it back to the girl that sent me this letter. And uh, I thought, oh, well. That'll get rid of the skull, and it'll probably get the point across quite clearly to this girl uh, that the, you know, this guy was very disappointed in getting the Dear John letter. Uh, so I asked Rufus, and Rufus says, sounds like a good idea. So this guy packed up the skull. We didn't hear the screams all the way to Vietnam, but they probably heard it for quite a while, quite a distance around her house when she opened that, that thing up. And... Uh, um, a little bit after that, uh, there was a guy that walked into fire direction control, and I looked up real quick, and I thought, 
That's Vernon Gillespie. Now, he's this guy that had been in Special Forces. I mentioned that they had the article written about him in National Geographic. And I, I looked and he had uh, uh, Browning High Power that I recognized on his hip. Now, this is not a standard issue weapon. Most of the other countries in the world used it, but the United States did not. And I commented, hey, nice looking uh, high power, sir. And he says, you recognize that? And I said, yeah. And he said, uh, what do you know about it? And I said, well, Canadian government uses it, Belgian government uses it, most other NATO countries use it. And he said, do you know how to field strip one? Oh, yes, sir. And he goes ahead and flaps his running high power down in front of me on a radio table. And, you know, i got bank radios in front of me. And go ahead and pull the thing apart and, uh, you know, check to make sure the, the uh, magazine safety works. And uh, then put it back together for him. And uh, he said, do you know much about foreign weapons? And I said, uh, yeah, I've studied them. But I said I haven't really had a chance to, to actually handle any of them. But I said... Uh, I spent a lot of time with Smith Small Arms World. Smith uh, was the uh, curator of the uh, Firearms Museum at, West, at um, Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, uh, you know how to take an AK-47 apart? And I said, yes, sir. And uh, he said, how about an SAS? Yes, sir. And he said, uh, next time I, c I come in, he says, I've got uh, 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 access to an AK-47. Well, uh, anyway, you know, we talked a little bit and he said, uh, you seem to know your way around pretty well for somebody that's been out here less, been over here less than a month. And I said, well, I studied it pretty carefully before I came over. And he decided that, uh, yeah, I probably ought to be in the S2 section and forget this plotting board stuff. Okay. So, and for the benefit of those who don't know what S2 is. Yeah, and you know, I was going to be able to help him figure out some information in advance. So, right. so you go over to intelligence from prior direction. Yeah, and so the, uh, the, which was the other half of this GP medium tent. Now, during monsoon season, we actually uh, dug a trench through the middle of it because the water piled up too fast against the sandbags, so we had to drain some right through the middle. And we actually built a bridge across, uh, which we uh, christened, and since Rufus and I were two from the same state, it got christened the Mackinac Bridge uh, <laughs> across this stream that on rainy days of monsoon, you know, had not that much water in it, and, you know, just ran right through underneath the sandbags, and uh, so anyway, um, I got, you know, Gillespie was at that point sort of entering a big part of my life uh, as far as decisions that I made and where I got moved to. And uh, uh, he asked me about uh, landing zone bird and landing zone pony and I said, well, um, you know, at the Christmas truce, he said, uh, what have you got for data on where the North Vietnamese are? And I showed him on the map, you know, the locations where they'd been spotted and he said, uh, uh, who do you think is going to get hit? And I said, uh, probably Pony, sir. And he said, okay, what's your reason for Pony? And I said, or not Pony, but uh, Bird. And he said, uh, how come Bird? And I said, well, you know, we've only been here at Pony for a short period of time. And I said that the uh, North Vietnamese are usually pretty good about putting together sand tables and, and planning their attacks real careful with these three-dimensional sand table types of things. And I said, they don't know that much about uh, LZ Pony yet. And I said, uh, we've uh, intercepted one of their recon teams on one of these things they'd been out with with Rufus Spinford and uh, down several of their North Vietnamese uh, guys that, you know, they had, uh, they had paper and they'd already started a map at that point. And I said, uh, you know, we may have better may have interrupted them, but I said, I really don't think they know much about Pony yet. And uh, he, he said, well, I'm thinking the same thing because Bird has been there uh, a couple, three months. And, uh, you know, whereas we've only been here a few weeks. So uh, he said um, he was going to explain that to uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Culp. 
and Lieutenant Colonel Cobb flew over to LZ Bird and told uh, the company command or battery commander uh, and the officers that, about this beehive round, which is the one that fires all these flechettes out of the 105 millimeter. It's like a giant shotgun effect. Yeah, like a giant shotgun, except yeah. instead of shotgun pellets, they're nails about that long with mm -hmm. fins on the back of them. And uh, anyway, uh, Colonel Culp explained about the flechettes and said that, uh, okay, you know, this is the way to warn everybody. They're going to fire beehive rounds and uh, we want at least six beehive rounds in every one of the gun pits for the 105s. So uh, that was all properly arranged, you know. Colonel Culp got everybody prepared and they also had beehive rounds put to the uh, uh, second and seventeenth. Now, the thing is that second and seventeenth was not familiar with Beehive, uh, but they were, you know, uh, told how to use them. And unfortunately, second and seventeenth was not really in a position where it could fire much support, except for about one quarter of the LC with Beehive rounds. Uh, LZ Bird was a little bit better set up for using BI rounds even back into their own perimeter, which uh, turned out they did have to do. And uh, anyway, as we're kind of looking at what's going to happen over the Christmas truce, uh, day before uh, there was uh, another one of these recon teams of either Viet Cong or North Vietnamese that slid into a gully just outside of LZ Pony between where the brigade headquarters was and where, uh, you know, we were with 2nd and 19th. Uh, we had to be fairly close together because we actually used landlines to communicate. So there was an area where they had a helipad and all the lines went down the helipad and the perimeter was there. There was this engine country area probably about 75 yards in between. Well, that's where the bad guys got. Uh, and there was firing back and forth at each other between the guys near the helipad and the guys on her side of the perimeter. And even worse, third of the 18th had just come in, and really didn't know much about this area yet. And they proceeded to cut loose the 50 caliber machine guns off the top of their armored personnel carriers. Well, I mentioned the antenna farm. We lost two antennas that night as they're cranking across our own perimeter with 50 caliber, and they also destroyed one of our own helicopters in this little thing, and it turned out to really be nothing except uh, a couple, you know, Viet Cong or North Vietnamese that got in between, fired a couple shots to see what sort of trouble they could stir up, and, you know, uh, there were yells of ceasefire. And uh, the next morning, I went out and walked the perimeter and was talking to different guys about what they actually saw. Uh, except for the incident in this gully, nobody else had seen any other action around the perimeter. Uh, one of the guys I talked to was a machine gunner by the name of Thomas Duger. And uh, some of his gun crew were in uh, getting breakfast at the time. So Duger was the one I talked to and he said now he saw you know, really nothing out in his area. And uh, that evening, uh, this is just a little bit before the truce started, uh, Duger and his machine gun squad were going out for an ambush. And I took a picture of the three of them walking through the mud on LZ Pony just as they were leaving the perimeter, which uh, uh, there's a copy of that print that's down at the um, Infantry Museum at Fort Branning. It also became the uh, cover print for one of the uh, Vet Center's annual reports here and was also used as the cover of a book, um, Breaking Squelch, by a guy by the name of so uh, Steve Saunders, which is an excellent book. He wrote that for his uh, children, you know, who were asking the question, what did you do in the war, Daddy? And it's uh, not loaded with profanities, but it's a very, very accurate picture of what life as an infantryman was at. And uh, I purchased copies for a lot of the libraries around Muskegon, but the cover photograph on there is the one that I took. 
It shows Tom Duger leading his gun squad. The second guy in the middle was Steve Saunders. Now, Steve Saunders found out about that picture in 1990. He came to uh, the 50th anniversary of Airborne. Now, 2nd to the 8th was not near as well organized as 1st to the 8th was because we'd started getting together in 1986. So this was uh, reunion number five for us. And uh, he came over and says, uh, uh, well, I probably don't know any of you guys because I was just second of the eighth. I said, well, I got a picture of some guys from Charlie Company, second of the eighth, walking off of uh, LZ Pony back in December 66. I said, I don't know who the guys are. I said, one of them, uh, last, uh, uh, first name was Tom, last name started with a D. I said, it was not Dinger because I knew it, <laughs> knew it Tom Dinger. And I said, I can't remember exactly what it was. He said, you got the picture? And I said, yeah. And I pulled open my uh, briefcase that I had next to me because I was helping the registration table. And he looked at it and quickly grabbed a hold of the chairs, the arms of the chair, and sat down. And he says, that's me. And he points to the middle guy. And he says, that's Tom Duger. He died two months later, was shot in the head. And he said, uh, can you have a copy of that print made? Well, this happened to be an 8 by 10. So I gave him the cop the 8 by 10 and I said, I've got a slide I can make other pictures. Well, from that point until he closed out his law office, the picture of his family and the picture of him in Vietnam, you know, in that, uh, in that mud, were the two pictures that he had on display at his law office. And uh, he said, those were the two most important things in my life, were my Vietnam tour and raising family. And uh, so anyway, you know, that, that incident turned out to be a picture that has showed up various places. Uh, well, um, anyway, the Christmas truce came along, we knew uh, where some of the North Vietnamese were, and they were close enough they could have attacked either bird or pony. But, uh, you know, um, the consensus with some of us was that it was going to be bird, and there were other people who thought it was going to be pony because we didn't have any wire out yet, and there was, you know, practically no field of fire for us yet. But uh, the, anyway, they hit LZ Pony. Um, S.L.A. Marshall wrote a pretty good book on it called Bird the Christmas Tide Man. Wait, you just said they hit Pony. What? You just said they hit Pony. Uh, no, they hit Bird, okay. yeah. They hit L.Z. Bird, but uh, they hit uh, Bird the Christmas Tide Battle. Mm -hmm. And But I was on Pony, you know, roughly uh, five kilometers away. And we fired a lot of uh, support for that. One of the missions that I controlled was the uh, 175 unit that was firing off of L.C. Hammond. And uh, I could talk to them because we had the long antennas. And I was talking to a guy that was on outpost from uh, actually 1st the 8th Cav. And he could see where the mortars were firing on L.C. Bird. And I thought, well, 175s at that distance are not terribly accurate. I don't want to use them on LZ Bird because I might hit somebody. But mortar, round, mortar tubes sound like a good target. So I, uh, he couldn't give me a grid location, but uh, I said, well, pull out your M2 compass. And I said, put it under your poncho and charge it with the light. And then go ahead and give me an azimuth, an approximate distance. So he did. And I said, is there a hill on the right-hand side? And he said, yeah. I said, is there another little ridge shortly before you get to the big hill? Yeah. Okay, where are they in reference to ridge? And he says, well, uh, they're near the left-hand end of the ridge. I said, okay, good, I think I got it. So I went ahead and started uh, having them shoot 175 rounds. Well, Captain Weber, who was the S2 officer, had taken off to try to put some order because by this time, um, the 2nd and 19th artillery's fire direction patrol for B battery had actually abandoned their thing and shot up the radios because the North Vietnamese were just outside the tent. And uh, they'd retreated back to where the guns were. 
So we really had no real radio communication with the guys inside. Well, Captain Weber took off with an OH-13 helicopter. He had a pilot go out, fly the thing, and he's out there, you know, directing artillery fire. Uh, and then, of course, the other fire is being directed, direct fire by Lieutenant Piper uh, who, and Captain uh, Leonard Schlenker. Schlenker was B Battery's um, battery commander, and Leonard Schlenker was one of his lieutenant officers. And they were the ones that were primarily running the artillery fire that was shooting at the North Vietnamese, uh, you know, coming at them. Well, um, anyway, Captain Weber had made some passes, and he turned around and noticed that there were artillery rounds going off where he wasn't expecting artillery rounds. Well, uh, he called up on the radio and wanted to know why he saw these big, long, linear-type explosions, like 175s. And uh, I said, well, I'm running those off of L.C. Hammond. And he said to the pilot, you know, did you get air advisory on that? Well, uh, I don't know. It was kind of confusing when we took off. So anyway, Captain Weber is out there circling in this darkness and, you know, coming back for another pass on LZ Bird, not realizing the safe area of darkness is also the same one of these 175 rounds are going through. So he changed where his circle pattern was after that, and uh, he continued calling in fire. They uh, then later on sent 1st the 9th out there to uh, help uh, the guys on uh, LZ Bird. Uh, they fired beehive rounds at the North Vietnamese that were trying to turn some of the guns around, like all of Charlie 6 of the 16th. Guns had been uh, captured. There was a guy from Hudsonville by the name of Gary Peasley uh, who was killed at LZ Bird. Uh, he was awarded a Silver Star. He stood, uh, well, he actually stayed on top of one of the bunkers with his M60 machine gun and kept pouring fire into these hordes of North Vietnamese. Okay, right, stop. This is... Okay, we are now at part four of uh, Chief Helms' interview. Uh, we had been talking about the Christmas fight uh, at Ellison Bird and gotten to the point where a soldier from Hudsonville, Michigan, uh, had been killed. Uh, and so, you know, I guess wind up that and move us on from there. Okay, um, anyway, 1st to the 12th did have some heavy fights and stuff in there, and uh, some of it was, well, when they got to uh, the uh, 6th to the 16th artillery, it was to the point where it got to hand-to-hand -hand combat in the gun pits around their uh, 155 guns, and <clears throat> some of the North Vietnamese found out that their funny Karate things didn't necessarily work too well when there was some American that was willing to go ahead and grab them between both legs and take their head and turn it around, uh, and then throw the body back over the back over the side of the parapet, which did actually happen a couple of times there. Um, but uh, the and uh, uh, you know some of the North Vietnamese got beaten to death with rammer staffs and and so forth as they came in. Um, and, you know, when the guys ran out of ammunition, didn't have enough ammunition with them with their 16s, maybe they had it in a sleeping quarters that was not right by the guns or something at the time. Uh, but anyways, you know, there were a number of people that ran out of uh, small arms ammo. Well, most of the, most of the guys, uh, as the North Vietnamese took over the artillery um, pieces, uh, they retreated to three guns of uh, Bravo 2nd and the 19th. And there was a lieutenant by the name of Piper and Captain Schlenker that I already mentioned. And uh, they went ahead and were supposed to fire a five-star cluster prior to firing Beehive. Well, in the confusion, they couldn't find a five-star cluster. So they just went ahead and sufficed with, you know, just yelling Beehive. And people got down and the North Vietnamese who were trying to turn around an artillery piece and fire at the Americans uh, were yelling and screaming about, you know, all the things they were doing, America's you die, all this other stuff, and they're trying to turn around the guns, and um, 
they fired two beehive rounds. Uh, you know, there was, the first one was fired, and then I think it was Piper that said traverse left, and they traversed about, oh, uh, well, maybe five or six degrees and fired a second round, and there were, you know, just huge hunks torn in the North Vietnamese line, and that was followed by a rather stunned silence from the North Vietnamese that, like, geez, you know, we just lost 60 guys and two shots from those guns. And uh, so that kind of slowed things down as far as the North Vietnamese, and their attack eventually bogged down. Uh, first and Ninth was flown in on a sandbar quite near there, uh, and a, a gentle slope that came down to the river. Now, LZ Bird got its name because as the uh, river's streams came together, it almost looked like a bird from the air, from a helicopter. And anyway, they dropped off first and ninth near there. They managed to uh, go in and they hit the back of one of the North Vietnamese units. The North Vietnamese uh, backed away. Now, um, there was uh, Lieutenant Piper he had been injured during this. He had a lot of shrapnel and stuff from grenades in his legs. Uh, Colonel Culp, who was our battalion commander, got into the other H-13 that we had available at Pony and flew over to uh, LZ Bird. And he got dropped off and he took command of LZ Bird from that point on. Uh, Schlenker had been injured, Piper had been injured, and he told, you know, Lieutenant Piper didn't want to give up. He wanted to stay there at LZ Bird. And uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, James Culp uh, insisted that he go back to brief Major Hay, who was the S3 officer, back at LZ Pony, that Major Hay had to be briefed. Well, actually, that was not the case. It was a, a trick to get Piper to get on the helicopter. And uh, he had the helicopter pilot put the word out to me that, you know, when Piper arrived, I was to take him directly to Captain Risa, who was a battalion surgeon. And uh, so uh, as this battle is winding down, uh, I walk over to the helipad and, uh, you know, directed the helicopter in when it came in, you know, I could see it that had a PRC-25 that I put on my back so I could communicate with him as he was coming in. And uh, anyway, uh, I had a, another medic, you know, from 2nd to 19th with me, and he had a stretcher because I heard that Piper had lots of leg wounds, and I figured, well, we might have to carry him. So we had a stretcher. The two of us would have carried Piper down to Captain Risa. Uh, Piper was going to have absolutely nothing to do with that stretcher. Um, he had to go talk to Major Hay. It was important that he talk to Major Hay to, to debrief him. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, I realized there was no way I was going to get him to go down to see Captain Reese. So I told the guy with the stretcher to go back down, get Captain Reese, and have Captain Reese come up to the Tactical Operations Center. Uh, well, I walked uh, Lieutenant Piper over there and he's sitting in this folding metal chair on this dirt floor with a GP medium tent and uh, a, a couple beer bulbs for light, which is what we had in the operations end of the thing. And uh, anyway, he's um, really pretty animated. I don't think I've ever seen anybody so high on adrenaline as Lieutenant Piper was at that time. I mean, he was chattering away continuously to Major Hay. Meanwhile, Captain Reese is digging hunks of shrapnel out of his out of his legs, and he's sitting there on the on the metal chair, and I'm looking back over my shoulder at this going on. I thought, boy, that guy is really high. You know, it's got to be adrenaline because Piper is not one that would have uh, had any drugs at that time anyway. And I, wow, <laughs> you know, I'm just totally totally amazed that how wound he was. And uh, I kept doing my doing my job, you know, like uh, uh, taking calls on what, you know, the, where they wanted uh, helicopters and if they, you know, somebody had a target 
that we could fire towards where the retreating enemy were with artillery. And if I got the call, I would figure out what battery would shoot it and pass it on to the, the guys who would do all the data checks with the uh, um, planning board on the other side. You know, I could just yell from one end of the tent to the other. So that went on. Uh, the battle ended. Um, uh, I had a thing where I went out um, to wash clothes and wash my body once, where I had a guy by the name of Scott with me, and uh, we, we thought it was going to be perfectly quiet out there. We had a brief firefight with uh, two Viet Cong. They weren't North Vietnamese regulars. They were not real well equipped. Uh, one of them had an M1 carbine, the other one only had two grenades. And uh, we both had M16s, but you know, we were busy washing up at the time, so we didn't see them at first. And uh, when I first saw them, I thought, oh, geez, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, Viet Cong or at least, uh, you know, a Vietnamese civilian, and he's got a gun. And he's looking at me kind of evilly, and he's starting to fidget with that gun, getting it pointed towards me. So I yelled at Scott. Scott got down, and uh, then I noticed movement off to my left hand side, and there was uh, another Viet Cong that was coming at me, and he had his arm back like this, had a grenade, and you know they talk about you know careful sight picture and everything. There was no careful sight picture on my part. Matter of fact, I, I think I figured that, you know, I could keep him farther away if I stuck my rifle out farther. It wasn't even on my shoulder at the time. And I got off a couple rounds with uh, semi-automatic, and he started pitching forward. And uh, anyway, um, and later on, uh, he started falling, and, and I saw the grenade come out of his hand, but it didn't to have any distance to it, you know. He apparently was already dying at that point. But uh, anyway, it just came a few feet away from his head and went off. And, you know, I yelled grenade to Scott and Scott got down. And then when he came back up, he didn't have a good look at the, the guy with the M1 carbine either, but he fired some shots at the guy with the M1 carbine. And uh, we did find a blood trail, but did not chase it down because there were only two of us out there, and we were just out there to wash clothes and wash our bodies. We were not, you know, we were not going out there for a hunt, you know. It was the, that's just the way it was. Well, this uh, one Viet Cong that I'd hit, I'd, I'd hit three times in the chest, and then once kind of on an angle up through the, up through the shoulder as he was apparently falling. And uh, he also had lots of shrapnel wounds on his head and shoulder from the grenade going off. So I don't know whether I killed him or whether the grenade going off close to his head killed him, but it turned out to be uh, one dead one dead Viet Cong. Well, uh, we got back in and I reported it and Gillespie was real pleased that, you know, we'd gotten the kill out there. Uh, Captain Graniham was not so pleased because we hadn't cleared it with him that we were going outside of the perimeter to begin with. And he was the the battery command uh, battery commander for headquarters battery. Well, I was fortunate that by this time I was getting along real well with Gillespie and Weber, and they basically covered my ass for me on this on this little incident about being out and not letting his people know. Well, a little bit later, uh, we had been out uh, and came back in actually after dark. And uh, we found the trip flares that our guys had set out and found them real easily. And I told Captain Canetto and Captain, or, uh, Captain um, Weber, and he went over and talked to, uh, uh, talked to Granaham. I said, well, you know, I had a guy that had just came through the perimeter in the darkness, and he says, perimeter is not secure. And Granny Ham was insisting everything was right. Well, and then Gillespie got into it. They went out and found that the yeah, outlet was probably not real well secure because some of Granny Ham's infantry, uh, uh, rear area guys from 2nd 19th of work combo and put lines and stuff up like that.
It didn't occur to them if they wrapped white adhesive tape around these trip flares, they would show up a little bit even at night. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Granny M got kind of chewed out a bit on that, on not checking the perimeter properly. And so I'm kind of, well, I'm in more trouble with Granny M now. And it, uh, he and I never really struck it off real well the whole time I was, uh, or that he was the second, headquarters second and 19th. But I got along well with uh, Weber and uh, with uh, Gillespie and with Culp. So, uh, you know, I had some officers covering for me. Now, uh, Captain Weber came to me one day and he says, uh, We've got a correspondent that's flying in today. She's a French woman. Uh, her name is Michelle Ray. And he says, uh, I've heard from some other officers that she's a bit of a leftist. Now, she wants to come in and look at maps, so make sure you have all of the overlays off of them when she comes in. Because uh, she will just see terrain then, and nothing about what we knew about the enemy or what you know, where our units were. So uh, when she got there, I had that done. And listening to the conversation, I thought, dumb broad, you're going to drive your Renault up Highway 1, and normally the only people who figure they're safe driving up Highway 1 are the ones in convoy with a 40 millimeter duster and, and you know, all this other stuff in line. But now she's going to drive her Renault up Highway 1. And I explained to her about the, the, you know, Viet Cong, sometimes when there weren't Americans or South Vietnamese regulars around, have, they had roadblocks and they were, they would collect ransom, you know, taxes for anybody that was on the road. And I said, uh, also, you know, you being a woman and a French woman, you know, they might decide to t collect you for taxes and ransom you off to your newspaper. And uh, that's exactly what they did. Uh, they, they caught her and I'm thinking, well, I told you, we're being pretty dumb about that thing. And she wrote a book, uh, I think it's called Two Shores of Hell. And uh, they've got a copy of that book down at Hackley Library, which I donated to, but I, I met Michelle Ray that way. Now, the other correspondent that I saw at LZ Pony was SLA Marshall. Did I tell you about SLA Marshall or did I tell you? You talked about him in terms of background earlier, but not about this. Oh, okay. What you're seeing him for this. Yeah, uh, well, SLA Marshall uh, mentioned the book, The uh, Battle of LZ Bird had taken place. Well, he was collecting material to write the book, Bird the Christmas Tide Battle. And I didn't know that he was coming at the time. Uh, all of a sudden, there's this uh, kind of uh, paunchy, graying haired guy that walks in. He's got a name tag that says Marshall on it, but no rank. And I quickly I grabbed a hold of the guy and escorted him back out because all these maps have the overlays on them. Everything is, you know, secret and stuff that's, that's on there. Uh, and I walked him back out and I said, well, sir, you're not allowed in there because it's all classified. And he said, well, I'll, I'll be back a little later. Well, lo and behold, he comes back in with Captain Weber, who introduces him as retired General S.A. S.L.A. Marshall. It was written in Port Chop Hill, and I apologize to him, but, you know, he said, no problem, you know, you did your job. You didn't know who I was, and you immediately got me out when I walked through that, that canvas door at the end, end of the tent. And so that was my one and only meeting with SLA Marshall in Vietnam was uh, at LC Pony. Um, during the, uh, it got close to Tet, 1967, and Tet was not a big battle in 1967 in Vietnam like it was in 1968. Well, about that time we moved to a place called Landing Zone English. Landing Zone English was near Bong Song. Uh, it was bigger than LZ Pony was. Matter of fact, uh, they were in the process of expanding the length of the what they called a uh, PSP or perforated steel plank runway so that they could handle C 130s on it. Uh, they'd been running caribou's in there for quite a period of time. And uh, uh, at LZ English, we had to start all over again with. Uh, 
you know, a, a, a tent with sandbags around it, put up a new uh, headquarters thing and uh, start building our uh, little individual bunkers that we were going to sleep in. And uh, there at LSA English, they actually had enough generators around there. They were able to run a generator and run uh, movies that they showed on a, on a sheet at headquarters 2nd and 19th. So every once in a while, I got a chance to see a movie. Now, one of them was called The Last Centurions, and, or The Last Centurion, possibly, but it was about this French officer during the Vietnam War when France was there. Mm -hmm. And then later on, uh, after that was over with, he ended up fighting in the Civil War in Siberia. He was French Foreign Legion officer. Well, I managed to see the movie later on and see all of it without the clatter of uh, <laughs> the uh, generator going outside, but uh, and I thought that was kind of neat. And they, but primarily they showed uh, old western movies and so forth, which uh, seemed to be relatively popular. And it was a diversion from the rest of the things that were going on. Now, at Elsa English we used to get mortared. Uh, occasionally, and uh, one of the things I did fairly fairly early on was uh, I started putting together um, a sick call program where we'd go to the uh, villages around LZ English. I'd actually started that on LZ Pony. Granaham didn't like that at all. Um, uh, Gillespie and Weber initially weren't sure about it until we started bringing back uh, some good intelligence information. You know, as we started patching up the kids, some of the, the parents started talking to us. Oh yeah, uh, yesterday afternoon there were 20 Viet Cong that were on the far side of that rice paddy out there and they were going which direction, you know. So they started giving us information. Captain Weber decided that, you know, okay, uh, we'll start supporting these things. To, to back up a little bit, explain how you wound up doing this and what your inspiration was. Okay, the inspiration on it uh, was, like I said, I'd been a ski patrolman before. I'd been involved in first aid. I thought, you know, these poor little kids are caught up in the middle of this battle. They've got infected sores primarily on their feet uh, because, you know, if you've got a war going on, you've got all kinds of artillery shrapnel laying on the ground. The, guy, the kids were always stumbling over that. They had cut up feet and, you know, infections. Sometimes they had shrapnel in them. And, uh, and eventually we got a, um, a medic that went out with us and helped with that regular trained medic. And eventually Captain Risa started going out with us, uh, someone we were at uh, LSA English. Now, uh, we got started on that right away, and uh, everything seemed to go pretty well. Uh, one time we went out, and um, there were some Viet Cong that were in the village already. Uh, they had basically told the people to stay in their huts, because they were going to ambush the village sick, uh, the village sick call program. At the time, I was in charge of security for the thing. I was not doing much in the way of uh, bandaging things anymore because uh, Captain Risa went along and a couple of his regular medics. Now, initially I had been doing more stuff, cleaning up stuff with Fizax, pulling out little pieces of shrapnel, cleaning the stuff up, debriding the wounds and bandaging things up. Uh, we used an awful lot of a thing called zinc bacitracin, which now you can get without prescription here in the United States. but. Uh, uh, we must have used that up by the gallon, you know. And uh, also I told some people in the church that I was doing this. Well, there were uh, some people that worked for uh, 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 drug stores and stuff, like uh, Runcel Drugs over here. Uh, his daughter was dating John Mixer. and. Uh, not, no, no, uh, Runzel wasn't. Uh, Russell's daughter was dating John Mixer. Anyway, through the church, Runzel found out, you know, there were certain things that they had were, that were outdated. You know, they couldn't keep the bandages on the shelf anymore. 
So he wrote them off that they were being sent to Vietnam, boxed them up and sent them off to me. So we got some extra extra stuff like that that, uh, that could be used. And uh, uh, one of the things was that uh, there was a Girl Scout troop from uh, Ravana who uh, had uh, decided to adopt me as big brother in Vietnam. Uh, they started, you know, at Christmas time, they sent me Christmas cards. That was the start of the thing. And then they'd send letters, and every once in a while I'd send a letter back to them. And I mentioned about the poor condition the kids' clothing was in. Well, anyway, this Girl Scout troop did a knitting project. They knitted up a whole bunch of red mittens. Obviously, no use for red mittens in Vietnam, but we got a, got a big box of them. And I explained, uh, well, you know, it doesn't get cold enough. They really need mittens in Vietnam, you know. Midwinter, it gets down to about 60 degrees in rain, which, you know, if you're cold and wet, means shivering time, but uh, not any danger of frostbite or anything like that. And, uh, but uh, the kids thought the mittens were kind of neat because the color red is considered a sign of good luck. So they had gone ahead and hung those on their fruit trees around their, around their village that was supposed to keep away the bugs, or at least they thought so. I don't know whether it did or not, but anyhow, uh, the, you know, the, the, the mittens ended up hanging on trees and bushes. So let's wind back around your story. You said you hey, were head with one of these patrols and heading into a village that okay. strong were there. Yeah, now, um, at that one there was uh, uh, a girl that ran from around a hut and she started screaming, you buku VC, which mean, would mean mini VC. And uh, uh, as she was running at me, I noticed that there was Viet Cong that just appeared from around the back the same hut she'd come around. And he had an AK-47 in hand. And I had the M-60 machine gun at the time, not the, uh, not the M-16, but I actually had an M-60 with me. And normally around the LZ we would have a, about a 12 or 18 round starter strip in it. And then you had that uh, ply or, uh, paper box that had another 100 rounds in it, and you'd clip the end of that uh, to the end and it would pull it out of this box, but you try to keep the box closed so that that ammo didn't get dirty. You just said keep wiping down these 18 rounds out front. Well, uh, this Viet Cong came, ar came around the hut, pointed his AK at this girl that was running, and I got on the M60 and fired, and I remember seeing his AK-47 Firing full auto, mind you. And now in this movie, um, Saving Private Ryan, that bothered me at the one incident where it shows the troops in the surf and you can see somebody screaming, there's all the bullets coming in, but there's silence. Nothing going on. You just see this stuff happening, but you can't hear anything. Well, that's where my mind went. You know, I can see this thing. And it was almost in slow motion, just like on the movie Saving Private Ryan. I distinctly remember seeing a couple of those AK-47 AK, AK 47 cases coming out like this and tumbling in the air with a stream of smoke out of the front of the case. And they flipped off to the side. I'm thinking, bullets get there faster <laughs> on the M60. Well, uh, uh, as the girl got closer to me, I uh, somehow managed to hold that M60 up with just one arm, which normally is not something that you can do. I don't know, maybe the adrenaline was running too high for me right then. But I didn't drop the thing down. It, it seemed to stay right where it was, even though I was only firing with one hand. And I reached over and knocked this girl down uh, so that she was by this dead palm tree, or, or down palm tree, I should say, and was... Uh, probably, you know, destroyed by something during the war. But anyway, uh, she was laying behind this palm tree and I flopped down the prone position and uh, this um, Viet Cong had gone down, he just kind of gone backwards, slammed up against the wall of this hut. And I remember his AK had a death grip on it. He was still firing the thing. 
and the AK rounds were going up into the thatch roof. And I remember thinking, just like snow is this, you know, because this is winter time, and I'm thinking, yeah, you know, got this a little bit of back home type of thing, and uh, this this stuff is falling out on him. And, uh, you know, some of the other guys who were a little bit less savvy at firefights, um, you know, they hadn't started shooting yet, and I said, shoot the Viet Cong. And, you know, finally, uh, you know, a couple of the other guys started shooting because about this point, the Viet Cong, out of frustration, started shooting the civilians. And there were two women that were uh, standing in front of the hut. I saw one of them get shot by this Viet Cong that was behind a well, it was a stone well. And uh, anyway, I fired a couple rounds at him and a little bit later, he got up and ran towards the hut where he'd shot this one woman. And I um, uh, went ahead and swung out him with the uh, M60 machine gun and pulled the trigger and I went shunk. It was empty. I had not forgotten to hook the, the big strip onto it, you know, so I just fired this 12 to 18 round starter strip. And so I quick like flipped the switch on the right hand side so he could pull the feed cover up, pull the thing back, drop the, drop the new belt in, got it lined up, closed the feed cover, and uh, swung back on this guy. Well, he was by this time just about inside of the hut. He was right by the doorway. And I fired and I hit him through the guts and through the hip. But what I didn't notice was there was a young boy inside of the hut that I couldn't see because it was dark. You know, this Viet Cong was out in the open. The, the boy was in the darkness, there was no window on that side behind him. And anyway, one of my rounds went in and hit this kid at the elbow. And after this fight was over, I went in there because I could hear the screaming. And, uh, you know, this, this kid's elbow was just totally mangled. And that kind of really bothered me because I basically turned this kid into a cripple, mm -hmm. you know, and just smashed his elbow up with that uh, 308 round. And uh, I had, uh, you know, nightmares about that after I came back. And I used to go down to Lake Michigan and draw it out on the, on the sand. And I, after a while, realized that with the angle I was at, I, you know, even if there had been a window, I might not have been able to see him in there. This was one of those things that, yeah, you know, you're supposed to make sure of your target and what's behind it from the hunter safety class, but this was not a hunter safety class. This was a gunfight. I was shooting at the bad guy. I couldn't see what was in the darkness anyway, and I'd hit the kid. Well, the kid was medevaced out to a, a civilian hospital down in Quantra, and, uh, Quinion. I don't know what their final result was, but I'm assuming they probably just cut his arm off. And uh, but uh, anyway, uh, we sorted out the bad guys. We had not gotten all the bad guys. We did get a bunch of them. There was a group from uh, another one of the units that heard the gunfire. that came running down. They put a quick reaction team together, and they. Uh, followed blood trails and did catch up with a couple more of the Viet Cong later on, but most of them, or at least uh, the ones we hadn't shot in that first fight, managed to escape, but you know, the, it was a thing that once I got the other guys shooting, things kind of went our way. It's just there were some poor, you know, poor civilians that also got messed up, including this one that I knew I was the guy that did that. And uh, so uh, that was the only time that we went out on the little sick call that I uh, remember having a problem. Now, there was an uh, uh, Australian um, correspondent came to LZ English. Her name was Kate Webb, and there's been articles written about her. She's, you know, you can find her on the on the uh, computer with no problem. But uh, it doesn't have, you know, all of her articles that she wrote. 
Maybe if you were on the internet in Australia, you could find those. But one of the articles that she wrote was more than big guns, and it was about her village sick call program. Now, uh, Kate Webb was really only there for one full day, and uh, she, you know, went to other first cab units. I don't know which ones that she visited, but uh, she was real popular with us. She got the nickname Little Sister. And uh, she uh, looked like somebody had taken this ninth, ninth, uh, ninth grade girl and said, no, you don't go to high school, you go directly to Vietnam, and here's a, here's a clipboard, you know, uh, and, a, and a camera. And uh, anyway, uh, you know, the press corps down in uh, Saigon had quite a time with her because they just didn't believe this was a bona fide uh, reporter that had had a year of college as well as, you know, high school graduate and uh, had been sent by this, uh, one of the Australian newspapers. Now, she actually was born in uh, New Zealand, I understand, but uh, like Jill Galloway, she kept following wars for the rest of her life. She uh, went and did a lot of stuff with the Marine Corps. Uh, later on during the war, I don't know how much time she sent with the first cab, but one of the one of the stories involved her. Um, the company that she was with had stopped because they were just starting to clear a path through a, a minefield, and this officer, either a major or a lieutenant colonel, showed up. You know, all spit and polish and really looking sharp, except he's huge. You know, he's maybe 6'4", and just as this, you know, Dan Blocker type mm. of character. And uh, supposedly he'd been a professional football player uh, and had been in the Marine Corps Reserve and decided that he was going to do his time over there. Well, um, I'm not sure, but there's an article about the Battle of Way that talks about a, uh, a guy that commanded one of the units in the in the uh, uh, 5th Marines that had been a uh, uh, lineman for one of the pro football teams and was over there in Vietnam and was considered a pretty good leader. Well, the story on Kate Webb was that she was sitting there and this guy goes out and he's ready to walk out into the minefield. And she runs out in front of him and puts her arms out and, you know, like, what's this young woman trying to do, tell me where I can't go and where I can go? And he goes ahead and brushes her aside. And she gets back up off the ground and, you know, he's by this time headed farther into the minefield. And she runs up and grabs a hold of him. He's, she's wrapped around his neck on his back. And he goes ahead and brushes her off and she falls down off to the side. And about that time, the infantrymen get it across to him that he's standing in the middle of a minefield and she's laying in the middle of the minefield that they were just starting to clear. And they had to spend about the next 20 minutes getting the two of them extricated from where, they, where they'd walked into. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the stories about Kate Webb. And also in uh, uh, Afghanistan, uh, she spent about two hours perched out on a um, uh, a drainage pipe outside of the window with the bad guys looking for her inside and it's cold you know this, this particular time in Afghanistan and she's standing up there on the third or fourth floor outside the building you know hanging on for dear life to a water pipe or something <laughs> and you know she continued to do that sort of thing and uh uh, she eventually died of cancer just a couple of years ago, but uh, she was somebody that we kind of thought quite a bit about because she was willing to go out and do the different things. Well, uh, stuff continued on um, LZ uh, Pony. Uh, we, we, we uh, not Pony, that. but uh, LZ English. Yeah. And uh, the um, um, uh, Gillespie who by this time had moved up to uh, battalion commander and, uh, you know, decided that, yeah, we probably ought to have an underground bunker at LZ English because he thought we'd be a pretty good target. So uh, somebody from the engineers came with a bulldozer and plowed this trench. 
and Captain Granningham was sent to go ahead and uh, uh, be in charge of the bunch that went to get some stuff to build this. And uh, we flew on a CH-47 down to uh, Quignan. And at Quignan, they had a big storage depot. You know, there's this area about the size of maybe six tennis courts that says, you know, they're, they're stacked, stacked probably 10, 12 feet high. Toilet type one flush. And we're saying, wait a minute. Now, at LZ English, we don't have any flush toilets anywhere that we know of. I mean, we've got these uh, tubes that the powder for the eight inch rounds came in, stuck into the ground that, you know, we call piss tubes. And then uh, uh, for the other job, they had uh, a place where they had 55 gallon oil drums cut in half. And uh, you'd go into those, there was like an outhouse type situation. And uh, uh, every once in a while, somebody would be designated to pull that out. Now, there were usually guys that had worked in the field that weren't very smart and really shouldn't have been out there anyway. And many of them were uh, Project 100,000. Now, that was LBJ's thing where they were going to, you know, turn these guys that were unemployable skills, like during World War II, they'd done a real good job at training people that didn't have a whole lot of skills and do, you know, some fairly important stuff. Well, these guys with Project 100,000 were really, really slow, and if they got assigned to an infantry unit, the infantry company commander and platoon sergeant said, you know, this guy is going to do nothing to get people killed, you know, send them back to the rear. And they basically sent them back to the rear where they were turned into what's known as shit burners. And that's what they did, you know, a couple of times a day they would go out and pull these barrels out and put some diesel fuel in there, stir it up with a metal rod and set fire to the thing. And I mean, some of these guys were so, so dumb that one of the guys was told to go burn, uh, to go out and burn, burn the officer's shit house. Well, he didn't even dig the barrels up from underneath the thing when he said and burn the whole building down. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, you know, there were, there were some of those guys from 100,000 that made everybody else look bad because so many, so many of them got less than honorable discharges or, you know, or eventually were section aided out, that, you know, unable to adapt to military life. And, you know, so you saw a lot of the other than honorable discharges out of that. But most of them actually came from OBJ's, you know, Project 100,000. Well, uh, we would occasionally get mortared at LZ English. Uh, since uh, we were a good stopping point on Highway 1, uh, they would uh, go ahead and uh, uh, stop with the dusters and convoys there rather than running the, the bridges through engine country to the north of us on Highway 1 during the nighttime. They'd, pull up and circle the wagons. And uh, there's a guy from here in Muskegon that was on one of the dusters that uh, I'll get you his address and phone number later on. Uh, but uh, he was one of those guys that spent time in LC English and he knew where I was. He recognized several little places and uh, recognized several of the incidents later on. But uh, LC English, since it was brigade forward, also meant it had a huge ammo dump that provided ammo for all the artillery pieces all over the Bong Son Plain and the Sui Ka Valley and everything near there. And uh, during that time period, uh, 1st Brigade was sent to clear the Anlo River Valley. Now there's a book called Brennan's War that talks about the Anlo River Valley and the Tiger Mountains, the Tiger Mountains are actually what really is called the Kagat Mountains, just south of Bong Song and on the uh, South China Sea coast. But uh, uh, the Anlo River Valley was one of those places that uh, if you went outside any fire base that was there, uh, within 500 yards you could find a fight, you know, any time, day or night. And uh, anyway, they decided to move all the civilians out of there and turn it into a free fire zone. So uh, all the civilians were moved out, well, 
During the process of moving everybody else out, they found uh, some water buffalo. Some, uh, not water buffalo, but uh, elephants. And some of those had been shot and were dead, uh, you know, by passing helicopters. And, uh, you know, you put enough 308 bullets, even an elephant will die from it. <laughs> And uh, a guy by the name of James Knaffel, who was in First the Eighth, mentions that they had to wait and secure this dead water or dead uh, uh, elephant until somebody could come out with a chainsaw and harvest the tusk off of him. Well, there was some officer that was crazy enough about elephants that he figured they had to bring him back to L.C. English. Uh, they brought him back and put him into a uh, POW compound at L.C. English. Now, according to Major Polk, who was uh, took over from Hay, uh, you know, the official report was a, an intruder had started the fire at the ammo dump at Elsa English. Uh, Major Hay said, no, that wasn't it. That the uh, barbed wire didn't really stop the elephants. And they stampeded and went into the ammo dump and there was some mortar ammunition that was already sling loaded, ready to go out to some infantry company the next morning. And there was one infantryman guarding the ammo dump that sort of panicked and he takes his M79, touches off, misses the elephant, but hits this pallet of 81 millimeter mortar ammunition, which actually started the whole thing. But, you know, the uh, Westmoreland probably did not hear that this had anything to do with elephants. <laughs> and the press didn't either, but uh, Major Polk, who was a black major that took over from Hayes, said, yeah, that was that was the stampede of elephants where the guy cut loose some water around. But uh, anyway, uh, that was it. That was, like I said, at night. And uh, I saw the explosions going off there, and I thought, oh, geez, you know, that means we're going to be very short of ammo. So I quickly went down inside of the, the fire direction control bunker and said uh, put out a Tiger Niner Niner to check fire except for troops in contact, no interdictions. And then I went over and woke up Major Gillespie. And I told him, I said, sir, the ammo dump is on fire. And the next thing he told me was go ahead, go, go on the dock and tell him to check fire on, the, on any interdictions because he said all they're going to have there for the next day or two is what they've got on the, on the fire bases. I said, I've already done that, sir. And I was, um, he said, well, thank you, thank you, and, you know, yeah, go ahead and continue on with what you were doing. So I'm running back over to uh, the Fire Direction Control Center, which by this time was underground because of the fact that uh, uh, this little, uh, little trip with Granaham had been very productive. Uh, when we got to uh, when we got to Quinion, we found out that they had all kinds of stuff there, big timbers to keep things from shifting on board the boats. So, oh, good timbers for putting up to hold the side walls and all the sandbags that hold up the roof. And we had uh, permission to get those because uh, there was a civilian in charge of that. And he said, oh yeah, you can take all the timbers you want. They're just trash over here. They were used to keep tanks from sliding around and, and other things, you know, when they were coming over here. But uh, um, they also had some other, uh, other vehicles there. They had a front loader there. And uh, Captain Graham was looking at this load of uh, bunch, several big bundles of PSP, this perforated steel plank. He said, I sure wish we could get those back to LZ English. It would be real good to put across our beams and put sandbags on top of them for good overhead protection. And I said, well, I remember that uh, when the civilian left uh, to go live in his air-conditioned hotel room, that there's a board with keys on it. And he said, really? I said, yeah. I know how to run a front lo uh, a forklift, and I uh, said, go in and see if you can find the keys for a forklift. And he says, uh, uh, go ahead and take uh, two of those bundles outside and, you know, put them in a sling. And I said, 
two bundles might be a little bit much for that sling, sir. And he says, well, we'll, have, we'll tell the pilot to take it easy when we go back. But he says, I want both bundles. So we went ahead and put the bundles out there on the, on the sling. And this guy didn't come to work until probably 10 o'clock. And uh, we were going to leave earlier, of course. Uh, one of the other things uh, that I probably ought to digress on, Granham told me, he said, uh, go find your artillery fire direction control center here and, you know, or, uh, and find out what frequencies and uh, what batteries we can call for. We need artillery fire out here. Well, I couldn't find a real fire direction center, but I did find a place with a couple of antennas and it said officer of the day. So I tapped on them and introduced myself and I said, Captain Granningham wants me to get the uh, instructions uh, for where we can call in artillery fire from and the radio frequencies. And he, this lieutenant looked at me and he says, no, you don't get any frequencies. And I said, but, you know, Captain Granningham told me, and he says, nobody shoots around here and you're not about to start that. <laughs> and uh, I said, uh, well, when you sign a note that you're refusing to give me frequencies and, and firing batteries. So he did. And I went and caught up with the other guys that were going to an engineer mess hall. And uh, I went in there and uh, I noticed that they were awfully quiet and everybody's kind of looking at us like, uh, who brought the elephant into the room? And uh, they've got, you know, that looks like a mess hall back stateside with metal trays and the whole bit. And of course we've got helmets on and all of our gear. And, uh, there wasn't room for all of us to sit at one table, so I went to a, a table nearby where there were some engineers, and I said, do you mind if I join you? Oh, uh, that's okay. And uh, I went ahead and put my knee on the chair, and while I went ahead and slid my helmet underneath, and then hung my web gear over the back, and held onto the chair so I could sit down, because if I just hung my web gear on, it was going to flip that chair over with. And uh, uh, so... Anyway, I sat down and he's looking at me and he says, you got a magazine in that rifle? And I said, yeah, in the first cab, if you go anywhere, even to the outhouse, you'd better have your weapon with at least one, one magazine with you at all times. And uh, I said, otherwise you can get an Article 15. And uh, he said, but you got all that gear. And I said, well, I, I carry that to work with me every day from the bunker I sleep in to the fire direction control, hang it on, you know, uh, hang it on posts there. And he says, are those real grenades? I said, I wouldn't be carrying them if they were real grenades. I'm looking across the end and I said, where's your rifle? And the guy goes ahead and pulls out his billfold and he's got a number on there that says someplace in Quinion there's a rifle that if they ever get hit, he can go ahead and sign that rifle out. I'm kind of shaking my head like this. You know, a different world in Quinion than what we've got at LZ English and had at LZ Pony. So anyway, uh, we uh, go out the next morning uh, and a uh, helicopter comes in and uh, we climb, climb aboard and have somebody that's sympathetic to our cause go ahead and hook this sling of BSP uh, to the bottom. And we take off and are flying back to uh, Elsa English at uh, Bong Song. And all of a sudden this helicopter lurches upward real quickly. I cannot oh no. And the door gunner on the front of the helicopter is looking over the side. and. And then I hear him yell to the, uh, the pilot that we just lost our sling load. Well, apparently there was too much stuff for the sling load. <laughs> and uh, I uh, uh, quick like ran up the front and I said, uh, can you give me the grid location of where that PSP went down? And he did. And uh, Captain Granningham said, did you get the location? I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, we'll send uh, people out with uh, two more slings and we'll see if we can recover that. Well, they did. I mean, there were 
some kind of bent up corners <laughs> and stuff on, you know, where the stuff had crashed into somebody's rice paddy down there. But uh, anyway, we recovered that and used the sledgehammer to kind of, you know, square out the corners a little bit and used it for the roof of our bunker. Now, uh, the motto of 2nd and 19th Artillery was on the way. And Gillespie was, you know, fairly gung-ho type officer, it was battalion commander. And he had us paint sandbags and said, on the way. And we laid those on top of our bunker so any passing officer would know where the talk of 2nd and 19th was. And uh, so when our bunker was done, it had on the way on it and all kinds of stuff. Well, uh, as the tour went on, I came to a point where I was going to go on R&R. &R. Uh, r, r is a rec rest and re recreation. Uh, married guys got to go to Hawaii because their wives would, could meet them there. There were other places uh, like uh, down in uh, Hong Kong where people went. Uh, I picked Japan because I thought I'll never get another chance to see Japan. So uh, anyway, uh, from there I went uh, from LZ English to uh, Cameron Bay. I noticed the guys had air conditioned movie theaters there. They had outhouses and they slept in dry places. Now in LZ English, it was rainy season and uh, we sometimes had to share our bunker with snakes. And that was not good because some of the snakes over there, although they were only uh, about that long, they were related to the coral snake, mm -hmm. which we have in the United States. You know, you have to get a hold of a finger or something to gnaw on, but uh, the poison was deadly. I mean, they referred to them as two-step steaks. I don't know whether it was really that bad or not. But uh, So anyway, went through Quinyan, went to Japan. Uh, when I was in Japan, I spent several days at Camp Zama. Camp Zama is where they had the big hospital for the guys that had been wounded. And I would go over there every evening and play the piano for the guys that were hospitalized. And during the day I would travel around uh, around Japan. I didn't spend much time at the Ginza or any of those places. But I went to a couple of the PXs and did my Christmas shopping there uh, because we're headed, you know, this is uh, uh, October 67, so I thought it was a good time to get Christmas presents. So I got stuff for my sister and all those uh, all the other relatives and stuff, and the, the girl that I was dating at the time. And uh, sent all the presents back from there. I went to see uh, Ottawa Castle, got some good pictures of that. And uh, also I went to Hakone National Park, which is their uh, equivalent of a Yellowstone, and just a beautiful mountain area. I uh, got a chance to go to Mount Fuji. Um, and uh, I ate some good Japanese food there, sitting cross-legged on the floor on a, on a bamboo mat and the whole bit, you know, I had a chance to do all those neat things. And one of the guys that uh, uh, used to meet me on some of the things, and you know, we talked quite a bit, um, uh, I kind of picked up that uh, uh, he was a helicopter pilot with 229th. Uh, but uh, we talked mostly about family places we've been stateside and the things we were seeing that day and uh, you know what each of us had learned. Um, he was rather surprised when we got back on the airplane to go back to see that I was only in the E5. He assumed I was an officer and he says, you talk like an officer and I said, I live in officer country. I said, I didn't mean to deceive you or anything, but yeah, I'm really just an E5 and works at S2. And he said, well, you probably ought to be an officer because you, you seem to know your way around officer country real well and have a grasp of what's going on. Well, uh, a little bit after that, I had another incident with a, uh, um, a Chinook helicopter in L.J. English. Um, I had gone over to get some supplies from the brigade supply area to bring them back, you know, the word, um, you know, papers and clipboards and scissors and whatever else. But 
uh, and maybe some typewriter ribbons for the guys that typed on these old-fashioned manual typewriters that, you know, put my notes together. But on the, on the way back, I saw this uh, Chinook come down, and it wasn't right near the helipad, but I saw there were a couple of ambulances waiting. And I thought, okay, uh, I'll go, you know, I'm first aider, I can help move some of the guys off the helicopter. And I uh, ran towards the helicopter, hit the rear ramp, and fell down because it was all covered with blood. It was slippery and slimy. And uh, I went in the helicopter and most of the guys were dead. Uh, I helped carry them out and, you know, I was really, really kind of upset about the whole situation. You know, like, who let this happen that so many Americans got killed? In such a, a short period of time, and how did it happen? And um, um, as uh, we were getting, getting this helicopter was getting ready to leave, uh, I went up, and uh, the door gunner was kind of slumped over the M60 machine gun, and I thought he'd just been vomiting over the side. And I went up to him, and I said, "It's all right, you know, they're all gone." And he fell back, and he'd taken a 50 round, or a 50 caliber round that had gone right through his chicken plate armor and killed him. And uh, anyway, it seemed like that, the length of that helicopter seemed like it was forever as I was trying to run in the blood and stuff and told the guys, you know, we got another one inside. And uh, as they came back up with me, I took the guys helmet off and uh, the you know helicopter was already starting to crank up and the uh, thing started lifting off and I was thinking well I'm going to go back to where this battle was and I'm going to take revenge on somebody for what I've just seen and you know I was probably a little crazy at that time and maybe even a little bit more than a little crazy. But, you know, I wanted to see somebody on the other side die for what I'd just seen inside of this helicopter. Well, he flew maybe 100, 150 yards and landed at the place where the helicopter was normally supposed to be parked. And I, uh, uh, you know, went to the where the pilot's section was at the front, you know, just walked through that open hallway and he recognized I was not his normal door gunner on that side. And he said, uh, where's so-and-so? And he gave the guy's name. I said, if you mean the door gunner, he's dead. And he threw the log book at me that he had, you know, next to his seat. And, you know, I kind of backed up a little bit because he was obviously really ticked too. And we went outside the helicopter and sat and cried for a while in the sandbags around this revetment. And uh, I went back to headquarters 2nd and 19th uh, and uh, I walked back over because I told the jeep driver to drive back uh, when I you know, went to help with the helicopter. And uh, anyway, they were in there talking about the report going back to MAGB that, you know, this uh, particular unit had suffered moderate casualties in the on-law. And uh, I mentally came unglued at that point, you know. I started yelling and screaming like mad. And I, I woke up the next day, the Captain Risa or one of the medics, somebody had come up and sedated me. And uh, I'd been moved to my, uh, moved my normal sleeping quarters. And uh, uh, the uh, other guy that worked in the S2 section under um, Captain Weber came over and saw me the next morning and says, uh, uh, you started yelling and screaming act like a crazy man last night. And then I told him what I'd seen and he told me what had happened. And apparently this unit in the Ongo River Valley had seen two Viet Cong coming down the path in front of them and uh, went to ambush these two guys. What they didn't know was that 
North Vietnamese company had come down the come down the hill behind them. Stop there. Yeah. Okay. It says end of hour four. <laughs>